Thanks to ATI Physical Therapy for supporting the show. They're one of the leaders in clinical research within this profession of physical therapy. All 900 plus of their clinics placed within the 100th percentile in CMS's merit-based incentive program for the second consecutive year. Their team published over 20 peer-reviewed articles in 2022 alone, and they'll be presenting eight times at CSM in San Diego. What we're trying to show is they understand how important it is to stay up to date on what's going on in the profession. And ATI Physical Therapy are doing some really important work. If you want to join their team and jumpstart your career, go to ATIPT.com. That is ATIPT.com. On the show today, somebody I've sort of watched from afar, interacted with, um, li like to learn from in bits and pieces on this thing we call social media is Derek Cluey. Uh, he's a PT educator and researcher, all three of those things, at Duke University. Passion is educating the next generation of PTs who are going to come and take over our profession one day. And he loves integrating research and evidence with clinical practice. And he's involved with a number of knowledge translation and clinical practice guidelines. And those things excite me because that's the marriage of communication and physical therapy or communication and research. How do we take what we know and make it understandable and digestible and get it out into the world? So we're going to talk about medical misinformation, knowledge translation, as I mentioned, and how to get practice guidelines into clinical practice. Because that's the point. They're called clinical practice guidelines. But where are they? What are they? And how can we make them better? Derek's a super smart guy. We get really, really into some stuff. I get excited because you can tell because my voice gets really, really high pitched and I start speaking very quickly. So that's when you know I'm excited. And Derek was an interview or I, I don't want to call it an interview. It was a conversation that really just it, it excited me. So we kick things off, I believe, if I can remember correctly, with social media influence and influencers and what those are and what they're definitely not. So I want to thank Derek for his time because it was a really exciting conversation, not really an interview. Um, and I think you're going to learn a lot. Bottom line, it was just a fun conversation. All right. Uh, also uh, supporting the show is Physiotech. They're one of our new sponsors. This is pretty exciting. Here's the question. Would adding an additional $290 per patient per quarter help your business? I think you know it would. Remote patient monitoring can do that. RTM, remote therapeutic monitoring, can do that. But you might think it's complicated and time-consuming, but what if I told you it wasn't and didn't have to be complicated or time-consuming? And what if it also, and this is what we're here for, improved patient outcomes, reduced provider frustration, and improved clinic revenue? What if it did those things? Well, it is. Find out how to get started with RTM. Go to physiotech.ca. That's physio, T E C. Dot ca to find out more no strings attached and finally I want to th say thanks to our friends at mw therapy they've been with us for a while they deliver a modern all-in-one outpatient PR with the built-in patient portal marketing automation and billing features you want at a value you deserve mwtherapy.com that's where you go we're switching your emr is easy all right let's get to the episode this is pt pinecast <laughs> Welcome to PT Podcast. They say we have great physical therapy conversations on tap. My name is Jim McKay, and uh, you can find us on the socials at PT Podcast or at ptpinecast.com. A topic today that is near and dear to my heart. It's something that uh, I read about. I wish I had the silver bullet answer to because I think if you did, be a very rich person. Um, but I think we know that the, the right way to get anywhere is never the quick and easy way. It's all. It's always. It's always the way that's that's with the most resistance, or at least some resistance, right? And we'll get to the bottom of it. We'll get closer to the answer today with someone who's actually educating uh, on the answer, and that is our guest today. I have no problem piping in our own crowd crowd noise. Uh, Derek Cluey. Derek, welcome to the show. Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be on this show. Actually, very much an honor. Well, I will not. Uh, I will not disappoint you too much. I promise. I swear. Uh, I don't often start off by asking my guests about their children specifically, but you're pretty public about your 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 children. Um, they're fast, is all I'll say, and they're like exceptionally fast. Tell people who might not know about it, like your kids are crazy fast. <laughs> That's funny. I was wondering if this was going to come into the show or not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They 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 started running a long or a while ago, and um, just for whatever reason, I think my son especially had this just 
Born to Run. I don't know if you've ever read that book or not, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. really good book. Um, I really believe that he was kind of in that vein. And then my daughter was always a prisoner in the situation. And then she realized that she had some hidden talent as well. And uh, yeah, long distance running, cross country type stuff. They not only are they fast, but I think more importantly, and, and most fascinatingly enough, they love it. And I think they found their tribe of people, which is even cooler to see. So yeah, they, they've done all kinds of fun things. And my only hope is, is that when they're in their mid forties, they still love to run. And yeah. so we're trying to help promote it that way. But yeah, yeah. Good so fun pro- kids. Pro- proportionately like like your kids are running and competing and beating like pretty you know like kids way older than them yeah so they are uh i think my daughter actually uh she she would she's 10 and i think that she's probably good enough to probably be on uh not just a number of varsity teams but be the number one runner on a varsity high school team and then yeah my son um he's he, he has he has an engine that just goes and so he's uh done quite a few races like Marathon 10Ks, things of that nature, um, and typically comes in in the, the the top end of those fields, like in the wow. in the podium type levels. So it's it's fun to watch. They they that they're definitely faster than me now at this point, and um, I'm, I guess I'm at that age where I'm starting to slow down. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> Divergence uh, is happening. <laughs> well, let's put it this way. I mean, you know, uh, we've met a couple times, but like it's been fun watching, like sort of like just through the things that you share sort of their progression which you started off like ah, and it sort of fell off like yeah they're pretty fast and they're like oh no i think we got something here like they're not just fast because i'm their dad and it's kind of cool it's like they're exceptionally fast so whatever you're uh you know you're feeding them down there uh in in, in carolinas uh keep doing that because a lot that, of chocolate you know, milk a lot of chocolate milk smart. that's smart all right so that we the that wasn't the hardest question the hardest question we like to get out of the way first uh is what are you drinking what, what is on tap for uh for derek today Oh, I'm drinking actually something pretty good. Actually, it's up in your neck of the woods, I guess. But yeah. it says Southern Tier Brewing Company. I don't oh, yeah. Know that mm-hmm. it's not, so it's a uh, 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 Blackwater Series Nitro Hot Cocoa Imperial Stout. There's a lot there's of like words in there. there. Yeah, Southern there Tier is up near Buffalo, I think, uh, okay. somewhere up there. That's like up upstate. There's For a those lot of stuff in this. It's got cocoa powder, chocolate, and marshmallow flavors. All right. So How is incredible. it, by the way? Have you had it before? It's good? Oh yeah, it's it's okay. it's a knock your socks off imperial stout, so it's pretty darn good. <laughs> All right, uh, if people listen to the show, I know I like this one. This is called the Juice Bomb IPA uh, from Sloop Brewing, not very far from me in upstate New York. So, Derek, welcome to the show, and cheers! Thanks for uh, hanging out and talking with us. Thank you. Like a lot of conversations I get to have on the show, people know me as the guy who talks. I do a lot of listening. I mean, you can't, you know, it's not really easy to notice how much someone is listening. But this conversation and part of the program we're going to talk about that you have at Duke started off with a tweet. And it was somebody shared an article about misinformation and how it spreads and and how to combat it, right? It's kind of like the what, so what, and now what. I think we can mostly agree, as much as we can, that misinformation is not a good thing, right? Unless you're the person maybe perpetrating the misinformation for you know nefarious reasons. And um, I wanted to start off by pointing out that uh, I think his name is Seth Peterson had shared the article and then tagged in Chad Cook and then Ch- Chad t- tagged you in because you have there's a program at Duke that we're going to talk about. Ironically, the original tweet had an article linked in it, which was great. I tried to access it just to do some research for this article. I was like, yeah, let me remember that behind a paywall. So that's got to be one of the first things, which is like, man, it feels like the people trying to um, maybe fight misinformation or create more good information. We're doing it with one hand tied behind our back, because a lot of times we like to play by the rules. And what do they say? Uh, uh, a lies, a lie can make its way around the world before the truth has a chance to get out of bed. So um, let's talk about the program and why it exists. Um, and yeah. what it what it seeks out to fight. So, you know, describe the program and, you know, why, why does it exist and what do you get to do there? Yeah, you know, actually, it's interesting because I don't know if we actually have a specific program. So it's embedded in the evidence-based practice course series. Okay. And it's essentially, and it's interesting because actually since being invited to be on this show, I've had a lot of chances to reflect and probably even modernize it a little bit. I think part of the problem with misinformation is it's just so easy. Information is so, so easy, easy now. And and good information is hard to get, as you just alluded to. I think if we look at the majority or probably all PT programs embedded in evidence-based practice is the intention to do good. But that doesn't necessarily sort of combat the 
uh, the defense, I suppose, for all the bad information that is out there. And as, you know, clinicians, you know, practicing, you know, high productivity, those kinds of things, information that is easily accessible and quick and allows for us to make those shortcuts is what we kind of lend ourselves to. So one of the things that we do with um, even our evidence-based practice course is provide kind of what a lot of PT programs do. And that's a lot of the types of information sources that we would want our students to gain their information from. But then we also talk a lot about the other sources of information, which is ultimately probably going to be where most clinicians will end up getting their information from. So we do discuss how to digest, if you will, uh, social media and those kinds of things. Cause there's, there's some good and then there's a lot of bad. And, and, and we talk a little bit about information and there's misinformation, there's disinformation. Misinformation is sort of inadvertent. I don't think there's anything necessarily, um, and negatively intentional about it. Disinformation is actually out there and that's actually where there's a lot of intent to almost harm or make financial gains off of. And that actually can actually propagate, propagate that misinformation. So we talk a little, we talk a lot about other sources of information. So classic evidence-based practice is the, you know, I always joke the food guide pyramid to evidence, right? So uh -huh. at the top right. of it is your, uh, your fruits and vegetables, I suppose. And at the bottom <laughs> of it is, is your, your chocolate and stuff. And we, and none of the uh, uh, evidence-based pyramids really discuss that aspect of information um, so much. And so we kind of blend and discuss where all that kind of lands and lies uh, and in terms of how that information can then be obtained um, from a student's perspective and such. But I think ultimately, I think we are still trying to do more good than anything. And so talking about, okay, this is where you want to get your, your, your information. You wanted to get it from PubMed. You want to get it from this. And so since being invited onto this show, there's actually going to be some things that I'll probably be revamping. And that's being very intentional about what ultimately clinicians will end up getting their information from, because I don't know too many people that go home at night and, you know, go on PubMed and, and do a PICO question and try to find the answer to their problems. Well, this, this, obviously I mentioned this is near and dear to my heart because this is where if you had a great Venn diagram, which by the way, for people out there listening is my favorite type of diagram. Um, it really crosses over with communications and physical therapy. And you mentioned the food pyramid. We're teaching people not what to think, but how to think, right? That's probably a better way of saying when you're instructing evidence-based practice, these are good places to forage for food. This is how you can sniff out something bad. Um, uh, and 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 hopefully that's what people remember as they go forward. But you mentioned it, it, it's more dense. And there's a guy we've had on the show numerous times. A guy's name's Mike Morrison, and he does PhD in um, user experience. So he's got this. Um, he's got a psychology background and a web design background, and he says this is why people. This is why your website's bad. And he's got the research to back it up. And he's like, I want to help scientists get better at it because they're. Um, their information is better. It's just their delivery um, where people who give away, you know, that we just had Halloween not long ago, people are handing out candy. Their information flies off the shelf, but it might not be the best quality for you. So how do we fight that? And that's that was actually something one of my original my professors when I first launched this show, I was a second year student. So I still had like a year and a half to go in PT school. And one of them sat me down and in a nice way said, listen, just understand that this thing called podcasting, this is 2015, sounds like it's going to be a thing, right? And just be careful because like, you know, and almost like quoting like Spider-Man, like with great power comes great responsibility. And it was like, you got a pretty big stage. And it made me say like, oh man, yeah, if I go, if we go on a tangent or if I put somebody in the seat, um, that could go far. And that's, that's a scary thing. I mean, you want to look at, you want to, you know, you want to use the Joe Rogans of the world for better or for worse, that goes far. And that's should be some that is power, but it should come with responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we one of the things that we do allude to is in terms of the sources of information, like obviously PubMed, RCTs, and all this stuff. But you know, we've we've all been clinicians, and you know, we sit in there and like the patient's not mine. And by the time you get there, your the the opportunities to create shortcuts just don't 
work. So then we end up in spaces where things are easy and they're also fed to us, right? So we don't actually have to go. So we become cognitively lazy um, yep. in some respects, not necessarily uh, with bad intent, but just because we're also just curious. And so it's, it's great, like things like Twitter and those kinds of things. And we, and we, and there are influencers out there who um, can give us a lot of information. And it's interesting that you said that those who oftentimes, not always, because there are definitely scientists who are influencers as well and who have credibility. Um, and not to say that people who don't have a research publication track don't have credibility, but ultimately it is it it tips the scales more toward um, those who have a little bit less of that uh, um, scientific credibility who are a lot of times um, disseminating and pushing that information out. So one of the things that we do discuss with our students is that that's not bad uh, because that's what you're going to be getting your information from, but then trying to find those trusted sources uh, that can provide the information that you're needing. And then also just to even take a look at your social media, uh, uh, just kind of take a purview of it. And if it seems to be satisfying your confirmation biases, right. then it's a chance to opt an opportunity to kind of expand out what it is, because sometimes it's also good to see those other um, vantage points. But one of the things that, and, and Chad Cook actually talks about this, and I think it's a great index because it's actually a true index. Have you, have you heard of the Kardashian index? The K index. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, talking the K, about. yeah, the K index. And we talk about that, right? So there's, uh, a, and actually a lot of professors and researchers are very keen on that. Well, because so, the, the, it's a playoff of the H index, right? Yes. It's the H index, yes. right. It, it's, a, it's kind of a playoff of it. It's actually a little bit more of, um, it's based off of the, the amount of social media influence you have, and that can be measured by the number of followers, the number of right. tweets that you have and that sort of thing, as compared to the number of publications that right. you have. And so somebody who has a high Kardashian index, which is why we know it's called Kardashian is because there's a lot of um, fluff without a lot of substance. And so right. famous for being and, famous, <laughs> right. Famous for being famous. And so we look at that and, and, and if you, if you're, if your social media's um, pushes are being, kind of funneled through that sort of mediums, individuals that have, may have what you perceive to be, and actually you can count it, but I don't think that anybody really does, but has large K indexes, then maybe, um, you know, finding those sources of information that um, right. are a bit different. A lot of pomp, but not a whole lot of circumstance. Yeah. I, I It's interesting because I, I look at some of the, the, the greatest researchers and contributors in physical therapy, especially, uh, and look to see, okay, well, how many followers do these individuals right. have and they and they don't and that part of that is because they're not pushing things out right so part right. of it is that they're not giving the information available so so i i stand at a, a a unique vantage point i'm weird i understand this so i tackle or i look at what you just mentioned as a great opportunity right you have really smart people and typically what i do is i reach out to people like you um and i say hey come on my show i'd love to talk most of the time People, you know, they'll say yes. Most of the time, people very humble, like, I don't really have anything to add. And I'm like, I don't know, man. You just wrote an entire book on this subject. I think we could have a 20-minute convo about it. But most of the time, what you're mentioning is the smartest people in the room are typically the most humble. They're also terribly busy. They aren't trained in communicating, right? So it's something that's outside of their comfort zone. They sometimes don't think it's necessarily in their scope and that some, some imposter syndrome creeps in. This is my day job at Mount Sinai Hospital. I work with some crazy smart people. And I'll be like, you just had this publication or you just did a project with the World Health Organization. Maybe we should do like a 15 minute breakdown. And they'll say, I don't know if I have anything to add. And I'm like, I don't know. You're one of six people on the World Health Organization thing. I think you do have something to add. I think people need to hear it. So it really is funny. It's like sometimes we're our own worst enemies. Sometimes the information isn't getting out because of these very humble or simple, but not easy reasons to overcome. And I run into the same thing. I say most of my job as a as a science communicator in my day job is 10% communications and 90% psychology with people. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, it's interesting with the, uh, in terms of, especially, you know, researchers and other individuals that might be able to give less misinformation. I think part of that is just in their ingrained in some of their 
their, their being, if you will. As a scientist, you're always looking at the true curiosity, no right. agenda noted, right? right? So in terms of influencers, it, people are people aren't influenced by the uh, uh, things that are boring or things that kind of fall in the midline or things that are kind of like, well, it may be effective. I don't know. It may right. not be effective. Like that doesn't help Joe clinician out there uh, right. working and, and managing patients. They're looking for, and actually we're grabbing those straws of something that like, show me the effect. And if you look at a lot right. of the research studies, those effect sizes don't tend to fall into, and even they don't even match what we see clinically, then there's a whole different conversation around on that. And so I think we naturally gravitate toward those who have uh, stronger levels of, of influence just because that's what we, we seek in our own biases, if we will, or our own desires. Um, so we kind of want these, these shortcuts to get us to these endpoints. And that's why we talk a lot about bias uh, when we, in our, in our evidence-based practice course and, and not just bias and research because bias and research is, it's kind of boring. Like I think that whenever I have my students, like, can you tell me all the different types of bias that are in this? And by the time that they're done, they'll never do that activity again. And they kind of recognize it. Right. I think actually looking at your own internal biases and trying to recognize what your biases are and trying to, how to combat those that actually kind of helps get to some of the information, some of the issues about misinformation. Cause if you look at misinformation literature, it's kind of, there's, I've read it as like there's four different kind of layers to misinformation. There's, policy okay. level misinformation which is kind of like you know that there that that's a whole different that's not even within our wheelhouse and there's organizational so things that you know you can find organizational type policies and things like that that can help to combat misinformation and certainly that's something that we talk to our students too about like you know get into a system or a you know a position where you actually are, have opportunities to combat some of that and then there is the inter, the intrapersonal and then the personal levels of uh, misinformation. And interpersonal right. is the relationships that we have. And then the the individual level is what we, I think, is the hard part. And that's the stuff that we try to get to our students so that way they can actually sort of think a little bit for themselves, think a little bit critically, including not just research, because I think we do a little bit of um we don't do enough justification if we just have our students critically appraise research. And actually some of the things that we are um, looking to do is critically appraise social media, right? critically yeah. appraise and be very intentional about, okay, where, where was this source? Did you verify it? Did you, did, who, who did this? Why did they do this? What did they do? You know, what is the the purpose and, and the, and, and the intent around some of these things? And, and I think that helps to combat that a bit there. I've uh, I've told people like take it from a guy whose job was to get you to listen for twelve more minutes so we could get to a commercial break. Now, obviously, I wanted to play music and you know tell jokes and stuff like that, and that was my that's why I was you know good at what I did if you liked it or didn't. But I would tell people all the time like understand that the job of media is to get you to consume more. And now with like the tools that I'm pointing at the cell phone here, like these apps are very sophisticated in terms of using your brain against you if you want to say or 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 at least you know at least touching on the little centers of the brain that get you to to use these apps longer and i love the fact that we didn't plan this but you started off by saying food pyramid and i've done a whole twitter thread before on it's your social media diet it's called a news feed what are you consuming this is content that you are consuming and i've been guilty of it before of getting like angst and been like why are you doing this it's like well you know bad stuff in bad stuff out so you should monitor your diet and what information you're you're consuming and then also what you're saying which is if you're only consuming if i'm only consuming carrots well, I don't know, man. I'm probably going to get orange eventually. So maybe I need to throw in some green. So it is also a mix of not only, you know, good stuff. And I'm using air quotes in a podcast, which is never good, but good stuff because good is subjective, right? So it's it get a mix, understand that there's biases there. They're going to be there whether you recognize them or not. They're unconscious biases. Um, man, this this seems complicated, especially if you're a PT. So you're like, I just came here for the answer, man. And then they get to someone, uh, a good professor who goes, I'm not here to give you the answer. I'm here to teach you how to think. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah, exactly. Teaching you how to think critically. It's interesting that you say that, you know, um, and I, I'm on Instagram. I've, I'm a little bit on Twitter. 
Um, I don't have probably quite the influence on there. It's, it's kind of interesting. You get a little bit of um, social media fatigue in some regards. Sure. Um, but it's interesting. The uh, where was I going with my thought? My thought was that if you're with the uh, social media, it allows for that. I think I alluded to it earlier, that cognitive laziness and we're all our cognitive fatigue and, and to, to full credit, like, I mean, I remember being in the clinic 40 hours a week, productivity demands, going home, documenting, you know, kids at home, that kind of stuff. So how am I going to get my information consumed to me easily? Well, it's stopping at McDonald's and getting a good burger and some greasy French yeah. fries and having it fed to me that way and not having to take the time to cook a better burger or to cook yeah. something that's a little bit so that's going to be better for me. That's going to take some time and, and effort. And how do we stop that? I mean, it, it, we can't um, in some respects, um, but we, I, I think that we have, yeah. I mean, and that's the million dollar question right there. Right. I mean, that's like, oh. how do you stop yourself from going there and, and, and doing something that's a little bit better for you? So I've jumped in before and I, and, and there's been a piece of information and people will, you know, screenshot it as to not propagate the information and they'll blur some things out, but they'll share the information and say, how do you know, they have to stop. They use a lot. I focus on words, right? Like pronouns. They, how do we stop them from doing this? And I would come back and say, uh, that's probably futile. That's going to take so much effort for so little result. And then I'll, in a good way, at least try to sort of poke the bear and say, what have you done to combat this in a good way? Right? So if, if the lie has speed and we started off by talking about misinformation and the truth has endurance, let's say that's true. What have you created? If all you do is yell at the windmill, that really doesn't do anything. So I got a unique position is that I get to serve on the board of trustees for the foundation for PT research. And if you look at the foundation list, go to the website. I am the sore thumb. Stanley <laughs> Harris, like Marilyn, Marilyn Moffat, like Becky Craig, like Jimmy does not fit. Like one of these things is not like the other. It's Jimmy. And I remember I sat there for the first six months and just sat up straight and, you know, not to blow too much smoke, but these, I'm like sitting in the room with these super legends and stuff. And I'm like, I don't know what happened. Maybe there was another guy with my name and I got the right, the wrong email invitation or something. And then one of them, I won't say which one, but pulled me aside and said, we need you to show us how to do the thing we're not doing at all in a good way. And I shouldn't say at all, but man, we know so much. Where is our problem? Do we need more research? And this sounds weird coming from a guy who works as a trustee on, the, on a, a research foundation. Yes, we do. But I'm looking at the backlog of all the stuff that we know now and saying that hasn't gotten out there. And that's that often cited 17 years from bench to bedside. I know that some people will argue that. And I, you know, I wish it, it, it I, I hope it's not that long. But that's where I say, man, if you have someone who's creating research and they're not communicating it, I want to blame the researcher. And I come back and say, have you taught that person? Have you trained them? I say the two, the three T's. Have you given them the tools, the training, and the time? as well as the prompt to say, no, no, this is your place. You, this, you are, this, is, this, is, this is what we'd love you to do. I would say that we haven't for most researchers taught them how to do this. That's something that they are not educated in or might, might not be educated in, most of them. But they've got something to say. To me, as a content creator, I'm like, oh, give me that person all day. I'll find the ways using video, picture, words, or sounds to get that information and share it. And to me, that's how you, that's the only way we make progress. Yelling at the windmill ain't going to do it. Yeah. And that alludes to the, the organizational um, aspect of yeah, what does that mean? What is and organizational? So it, it kind of gets into what you were just saying there. So uh, it, specifically with like a board of trustees for foundation for PT. Um, well, one example that I actually, I think is really good. I don't actually know who they are or who is, uh, their, their social media content editors, but I know the uh, orthopedic Academy and I think the sports Academy have very specific individuals now who are on. It's me for, it's me for ortho. Just FYI. Okay, so like, <laughs> I think he's okay. Um, <laughs> so they, and, and, and actually that's, that's great because then now you get sort of the um, interaction and the engagement from right. an organization with a, an individual, but it's, it's actually quite fascinating. And, and I serve um, on the um, board of directors for the American Academy of Manual Physical Therapy. And, you know, we send out um, a tweet about something, you know, we send out a tweet about manual therapy, you know, manual therapy gets a lot of um, kind of hits and takes a lot of attacks and stuff like that, um, you know, for, for better, for worse or whatever. Um, 
but you know, so a- Aamp puts out something on Instagram or Twitter and it gets like two likes. Right. And then you have somebody that puts something out and, and it, it, be it Chad Cook, be it Dan Rohn, be it somebody that has some um, influence on social media. And then next thing you know, there's so much engagement interaction within that. And I think that's what we talk a little bit about um, to our students is that, you know, again, finding those trusted sources, students don't have any idea who that is. Sure. And they shouldn't be fed that necessarily. So it shouldn't be like, you should be following these people. Right. Um, but it's interesting how that, there's so much of a difference between that. Well, see, there's some, there is a difference. All right. So let's use the example you just, you just shared. AMP shares something. It'd be great if we could, if we could A, B test this, or I don't even know if that's right. If it's an, APA? if you shared it, yeah. If you share the same information from two different channels, what would that be? Like if Dan Roan, who you just mentioned, and AMP shared the same thing. Yeah. It would be you, just a, yeah. It would be just a, essentially a, well, it wouldn't be a randomized control trial. It would just be a control trial. Got it. All right. So this is why you're here to make sure I don't say the wrong thing. So, and then why would, in theory, if Dan got more engagement, we'd have then then our question would be like, that's interesting. Why is that? And I would say one of my things we have to check this, of course, would be because he is engaging. He leads with most of the time people who are actually really um, uh, sought out on social media or have larger following lead with gives. Right. I mean. Why would anybody listen to a podcast launched by a second year PT student? He, I, he me, doesn't have a lot to share, but it, I understood that the focus of my show was the guest. Like, I liked talking to people when I owned a microphone. Like, that was literally the barrier to entry to starting a podcast in 2015. Still is, actually. And so I would say that a lot of times, large organizations, and I'm not saying AMP does or does not this, um, they're almost too impersonal. Yes. So a lot of times if you if you go to that person and people are fallible and they're quirky and people engage better with people than we do with brands or icons. And that's why people have that's why we put people on Wheaties boxes. And that's why, you know, Nike signs athletes with faces and personalities um, and quirks. Um, I don't have the silver bullet. But that's what I try to do with with orthopedics, which is I don't think Jimmy's the is the answer i think i would love to be the facilitator i tell people all the time usually before i start a podcast i say listen i'm the best batting practice pitcher you're ever going to meet i put it right over the middle easy to hit because my goal there is to serve it up so you hit the home run because you're the expert so i would say that we probably need more fallibility in people and less um perfection and that's probably like you know if someone says i had someone say like how come you don't you're not very organized with your questions and i'm like i don't it's not me that would come off disingenuous yeah and and, and we 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 i think you know obviously there's we we love our associations we love our academies we love our you know all those things but we really love our stars yeah we, we love those things. And so where does a lot of misinformation potentially come from? And it is influencers and those who are influencing um, sometimes are providing the right information and then sometimes they're not. And I think as a, as a new grad, so going back to the the program and some of the information that we, we talk about is trying to identify those sources of information. And I think one of the fallacies and actually some of them I'm going to probably revamp a little bit in our evidence-based practice course is even just to make it a little more modern is that the way that we've instructed evidence-based practice and the way that we've talked about how to have, you know, the food guide and to have the pyramid on top while all in, in, in good intent and, and, and definitely needs to happen. There has to be the layer of, well, ultimately how are they going to receive their information? They're right. not going to receive it by, like I said, going right. home and doing right. a PICO question on a puppet. There may be some of those folks. Um, it was not me. I'm nerdy enough, but I'm not that nerdy. <laughs> and I know that we get our information otherwise. So then how do you find and then how do you set up those sort of um, uh, ways that information ways. can be transmitted to you appropriately? And then also just ways that you can be critical in nature. I mean, Yes. And, and, and there are a lot of things that we actually, I mean, we still also talk about like, where are your, your sources of information? What can we do from an organizational level? What can we do otherwise that can help people with those necessary cognitive shortcuts that have to be made? And that, 
you know, comes from a lot of the things that we're doing. I mean, obviously like clinical practice guidelines and certain types of websites that can be used for sharing, but ultimately it still comes down to, I like this person's thought and I like the way that they're thinking and it feeds into my biases and that those salted French fries from McDonald's taste good. And I'm feeling that tonight when I'm tired and I've seen my patients and this is how I'm going to function and work with them. So path path leads resistance. Well, let's talk about CPGs, right? So in theory, um, a CPG is getting you from a pile of information, right? Because if you're, if let's say you're Derek and you, you have 40 hours a week and you got productivity guidelines, you've got to hit and, and goals and man, you're human. Like the more tired you are, the, the worse your thought processes are, but you want to learn something. So dadgummit, you're going to do it. And then someone comes along, an APTA or a section or academy or organization, and they say, we've got this CPG. we got this clinical practice guideline. It's not telling you what to do, but what we're doing is we're taking this big, let's say we've got 100, 100 different things that are spread out all over the place. We are going to do the hard work for you. You told us you don't have the time. Maybe breaking down research isn't your forte. Maybe you're a C minus in that, but you're really good at other things. We'll break it down to you to a guide. Why isn't that the silver bullet? Why aren't C- I mean, CPGs are good. I'm not here saying they're not good, but why haven't they solved the thing? You and I are still talking about problems. How come the CPGs haven't solved it? Ah, uh, because they're they're cumbersome. They're messy. They're hard to digest. They're hard to digest, right? I mean, it, it, it goes. I, I'd say a CPG. <laughs> I don't know how this is going to sound. I think you know, looking, going home, and doing a Pico question and on PubMed every night about your patient specific to it and changing the behavior that you use and and treating that patient differently. That's like, that's going out to whole foods and buying the fanciest ingredients and cooking every night for yourself when you have all kinds of time, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Instagram, Twitter, social media influencers, getting some of that quick information that kind of appeals to you and makes you feel good for at least for the moment, maybe she makes makes you feel a little bit bloated afterwards. Um, That's, that's McDonald's. I think CPGs are like Chipotle. Okay. Better, okay. Um, better for you, but still satisfy a little bit of this. Or actually, I think the desire is for them to be like Chipotle. I don't think they're actually are Chipotle. I think that's actually a, a good um, way that we need to think about um, the idea behind a, a, a CPG. I think the problem with CPGs is that they don't they don't tell us exactly what we want to do yet. And a lot of times they actually either conflict or they support what we're doing. But when they support what we want to do, it's not very exciting. It's Uh also just really hard to sometimes interpret the CPGs. I'm an author on the neck pain guideline. And and I think I'm, well, unless they, unless the Academy takes me off, but I'm supposed to be the next lead for the neck pain guideline. And they're just hard because they're just hard to get that information still, but it's faster than it is, um, Doing, going, yourself. doing it yourself and trying to find that information. So it gives you some of those recommendations. The implementation of those is really, really, really challenging. Um, and we get into sort of our, our habits. Uh, so I think that's part of the problem with uh, CPGs. And also to the other thing that we don't know about, which actually we're doing a little bit of research on is just like, so what if you do see, if you do these recommendations to your patients to actually truly get better or not, we don't really have um, that information at this point. We assume so because it's what the evidence kind of suggests, but we don't really know that yet. But I think it's just, I think they're just, they're still not easy enough. And again, that's where I think the low back pain guidelines, and you probably were a part of this because it was the American Academy. And I know um, I talked to Steve George a few times about that yep. one. That one got, that one got attacked, um, yep. I think pretty well. Um, and, and so it, which was great because the more attention. something gets attacked, it gives us a, some attention. Right. Uh, but then, it, then it's about a matter of now you've got misinformation. Right. And then, so as a, so this is a classic example of like, how would you, this would be a classic, um, uh, we didn't do it because it came out after our evidence-based practice course, but now that I'm speaking, we might actually use this as a example of, okay, how would you combat some of that misinformation, some of the, um, and, and, and how would you maybe some of it maybe being okay. And then some of it being like some misinformation centered on that. And then what information and what resources and what sources of information would you need to really be getting it from? Uh, so that's kind of that classic example. So I think that's problem with the uh, CPGs, just they're, they're cumbersome. Well, they're getting closer, right? I mean, cause that's, that's the idea is like, we listen to the audience. The audience said like, listen, you're close, but you're not really there. Like keep going. 
Um, so it's got to be pretty frustrating, especially when someone's like, you know, a CPG. And I only know this because I, my work with orthopedics, it's not an easy endeavor to create these things. I mean, these things are pretty, you know, in terms of time, effort, um, you know, energy and resources, like these things are cumbersome. I mean, you know this. Um, and they get close. Um, one thought I had, and since you've been involved with them, I've only been because I've only been working with um, orthopedics for a little less than a year. So only one has come out since I've actually been there. Um, is it just the authors that help you with, or in your experience, has there ever been a person who is non-clinical at all, a writer, a graphic designer, um, a coordinator, anybody with a, I mean, dare I say a liberal arts degree? <laughs> no. <laughs> simple answer and then, I yeah was... i mean exactly like like that's like they're boring i mean i'll, I'll be the first one to admit like when you're looking at a, a cpg they can be we, and we talk about this this is our, our sources of information we want something exciting like right. we want something that is going to be a little bit more informational i do think that there's that movement toward that i know that the implementation of guidelines right. is a big piece to that. And so, yeah, exactly. They're, you know, coming up with um, infographic, coming up with something that's easily digestible, something that could actually be shared right. in social media, uh, those sorts of things. Um, yeah. So it could, it could be. So I agree with most of what you said, but I'd be a boring podcast host, but I didn't disagree. So yes. I, I have this sort of paradigm where and I'll walk, I'll walk people through it in just a second, but um, I think they just use different um, or they use terminology, maybe not 100% correctly. So I agree with you that you can find candy, to use our food analogy, on social media very easily. But keep in mind, that's the how, not the what. Because I can find candy at Whole Foods. Like if I wanted to push back, I could say, well, Whole Foods isn't the place. That's the how, not the what. So I always like to say, this is how I look at it. And for those listening to the podcast, I'm going to refer to a slide here that I did not think I was actually going to put on the screen. <laughs> but what I have on here is the pyramid that I that I talk about. And, and this isn't you know my creation. I've sort of tweaked it anyway. But it goes from top down. It's like it's a it's an inverted food pyramid. And at the top, we talk about pillar content. And this would be a podcast, a video, a webinar, a blog or an infographic. So something very a little bit more dense or a cpg like an article these are all pillar content it took a long time to create probably re hopefully research well if, if we're talking about actual research then we break the thing down into what's called micro content so let's let's use a a piece of research let's use a, a, a published article pillar content but man, if Derek just goes, Jimmy, I have this new article and he, you know, he sends me the PDF. I'm like, yeah, I don't have an hour to, to, to devote to this now. I'll do it later. So what Derek might do is, hey, check out this quote I pulled and I made it into a fancy graphic. Or Derek was interviewed about it on some podcast and he's got a 30 second clip. And all these things are referred to as micro content. So these are high information sent, but low barrier to entry. And what I like to tell people is these are breadcrumbs that lead you to the pillar content. Now, notice we haven't talked about how we share this yet at all. I mean, a, a, a graphic on your computer is just on your computer. You have to put it somewhere or send it somehow to get other people to see it. And that's where social media comes in. So the bottom of this inverted pyramid is the share. You could share it via email. If you had an email list, that's a way to share. You could put it on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or any of the social networks. Um, you can put it on a website. That's a way to share. And then these things are feedback loops. So I agree with everything you said, but I wanted to make sure people listening were like, hey, like social media, and this is this was part of my Oxford debate in uh, in Chicago a couple of years ago, which I, I won, um, was that um, social media is neither bad nor good, but the prompt for my particular uh, Oxford debate was, is uh, could it be hazardous to the professional physical therapy? I'm pretty sure that's what it was, or... Um, it, it, I forget the exact prompt, but I remember it because I was yeah. like, hang on a second. All I have to do is show one instance where it might be hazardous and spreading of misinformation is it was not saying whether or not social media is good or bad. So it is a delivery device. I love actually, you know, the, 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 what is it? Not the evil stepsister, the, I guess the good stepsister or the, um, from the, little Wizard Riding, the little red riding hood, I guess, of misinformation is information. 
Right. And so one of the things that's actually really cool about social media is, you know, you, you, you've heard, and I don't think, I think this is just like a, um, like it's a myth bust. Or it's a myth, I think, more than a, and, and that's part of missing combating misinformation too is Correct. busting. But the, um, you know, we always talked about well, there's this seven year process for research to get turned into practice. Right. And I think that's like from the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s. I've heard 17. What we see, 17. Okay. So I'll, I'll be a little bit um, more optimistic and say seven. And that's a long time. I, I think it's actually slowed. I think it's sped things up. The problem is, is that it's sped everything up. Um, it's sped, you yeah. know, um, and then I think that that leads to some confusion and some frustration um, for clinicians. And I think that that's why I think a lot of times, and that's one of the things that we talk about with combating misinformation is just making sure that you have so sort of those uh, opposing angles and, and really, I mean, uh, the ultimate thing with um, combating misinformation is just making sure that you are getting your information from trusted sources. And so going back and looking and seeing, okay, just because they have 25,000 followers doesn't necessarily make that a trusted resource. And so making sure your information is from trusted resources and making sure that you're getting information from different lenses and different angles, because everybody's going to have interpretations of some of the information that's out there. And that's all okay. That's healthy. And that creates healthy dialogue. And as long as you're getting healthy dialogue, and as, actually, and as long as you can engage in a way that also has some healthy dialogue, not that you have to be actually um, physically engaging in that, but just mentally engaging in that, that always, um, that always helps. But I think actually the, the beauty of things like social media is it pushes things out that would otherwise just be sitting in no, PubMed. And like, I mean, I don't know how many people have, I mean, there's actually an app for PubMed and it's a, it's not really a great app. It's not a very user-friendly app or anything like that. It's like, we would never get this information out like we can now. It's just like, how do you take that information? And so I, I, I love that you showed that slide because I think there's some caution and I think some pause that we want to say, okay, so information on the web is, is misinformation and granted a lot of it is, but a lot of it is actually some, some valuable it's, information. Yeah. A lot of it is delivered. Like look at a guy like Neil deGrasse Tyson, right? He's an astrophysicist talks about a lot of dense stuff, but he spends a lot of time as educating, like breaking down super dense stuff. But he knows if I'm going to do this, it's got to be really simple. And dare I say, it's okay to be fun while you do it. Yes, that is not Im unprofessional. And it's funny because Neil deGrasse Tyson works at the Hayden Planetarium in New York City, which is typically visited by more children and students. And it's just funny how we change. I don't know what age it is, if it's 15 or 18 or 21. We go from, hey, we've got it. How does a bill become a bill? Well, let's make a song about it. We'll call it Schoolhouse Rocks. We stop doing that when we get to a certain level because we're too professional to do that. Except, you know what? I still know how a bill becomes a bill because it's schoolhouse so, rocks. Yes, yes. Don't don't drown your food was another one going back to the food guide pyramid from schoolhouse rock. But yeah, anybody remembers that one. Yeah. So to me, I always like to say, listen, you know, um, uh, you know, clickbait. I did a, I did like sort of like a, it was like eight eight o'clock in the morning. I woke up on a Saturday and I saw some clickbait article over my Cheerios and I immediately grabbed a microphone and a camera and I was like raging against it. And then halfway through this sort of like stream of consciousness, I was like, and how come we're not using the tactics that they used for good? If I hand you a sword and a shield and you go attack a village, that's bad. But I could give you the same tools to defend a village too. So you could use, you know, these tactics. These are psychological principles, user experience and user design principles, and you could use them for good. But most of the time, the people that are in charge of these projects, it's not in the funding. It's not in the funding. They haven't been given the tools, the training, the time. And that is a disappointment for me. Um, yeah, you're you're 100 percent right uh, that I think that that has to be a part of it. And, you know, to go back to the CPGs, you know, getting into, you know, OK, just because we published it in a journal and we made it open access, right? Like that's, right. that's the layer that we've gone to is it's open right. access. Um, that doesn't matter. That, that's doesn't. great for the individual. That's like really desiring Chipotle that night. But for, the, but for the most of those individuals, like that needs to be uh, front and center, often frequent. Um, and, and, and yeah. And, and, but you're right because there's not 
funding for that. And then there isn't incentive. There's, you know, so there's incentive to be an influencer and by no means am I sure. anywhere near a social media influencer, but there is, there is incentive to be an influencer, um, people's livelihoods and things that nature can be based off of that. Um, research isn't, it's, it, it doesn't have that intent, right? It's to try to determine what are some of the, it's, it's the process in determining what are some of the the potential truths that are out there. And so from a scientist perspective, like their whole, their whole being is just about, you know, well, let's, let's do this study. And I, I don't know, let's, you know, we have no agenda. We have no, um, uh, uh, you know, no intention of trying to, you know, get these results out for any kind of sort of purpose. And that's good because we don't want that to change because otherwise it wouldn't be science. That would ruin um, the case. But then what is that balance then? Right. Like, so what is the balance between, all right, so now we've got um, um, some scientific information. How can this be interpreted? How can we make it fun? How can we make it exciting? How can we make it digestible, easily digestible? That's, I think, I think that's a big piece that probably needs to be investigated. To me, you got two choices. Learn how to do it yourself or bring someone on your team who knows how to do it. And I tell people all the time, you know, I work with, you know, orthopedics and I work with the uh, HPA, the Catalyst, which is now the Academy of Leadership and Innovation. And I say, Jimmy does Jimmy things. So if, if you ask me how I think we should do this, and I say we should make a video, and then you begin by saying, well, it'll be me reading into a camera for three minutes. I'm going to say, that video ain't going to go nowhere. Save your money. Let Jimmy do Jimmy things. I'm not going to tell you how to change the content. But, you know, I mean, I think, I think on my job interview at Mount Sinai, I was talking to, like, the director of rehabilitation. Like, this dude runs, like, rehab across eight hospitals. Joe Herrera, great guy. And he goes, well, like, give me an example of what you would do. And I said, well, if David over here drops a great paper in nature, why doesn't that have a movie trailer? Tom Cruise is the most bankable movie star in the world, right? Comes out with a movie. They still run ads. They still make a trailer. You could just go out there and be like, Tom Cruise, it's in theaters. Go. That's like saying David Petrino. He released an article, a, a paper on long COVID. It's in PubMed. Go. We we are big, dumb animals. We need to be led there with information sent. This will be a good return on investment. You will get something, entertainment, information, and dare I say, bonus points if you can make both at the same time. Um, uh, success for me, Somebody, a student actually asked me, well, you're a science communicator. What does success look like for you in five to 10 years? I was like, ooh, good question. I was like, I want there to be more people with hybrid backgrounds and able to insert themselves because that's what I said. Listen, I have a degree in PT and a degree in communications. I'm not saying I'm an expert in PT research or content or any of those things. I know enough to ask the second or third or fourth question. And that might be the difference. I know enough to do it and how to do it and then what to do when we've got it. And I hope there's more people like that. And you know enough to recognize the how the audience wants to um, digest that information, Core which, is, which is key, which is a lot of what, um, when you look at misinformation, it's, um, you know, it, you know, at the core of it, it's charismatic, it's likable, it's, it's entertaining individuals. And that's not what we're necessarily needing to have, but at some level, we also need to move away from the staleness of some of the information. Yes. People, people get things, people get things fast. I mean, if you don't get information, at your fingertips and you don't get it almost ahead of the time that it actually is, is informed, then it's, then it, it's almost, it almost seems too incredible. Right. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the other seems more credible because it got there faster Correct. Uh, and it got there with more excitement. Right. Energy. Yeah. 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 yeah you, you have to fight that. And, 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 and this is the, um this is the play that, 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 that I do. I'll bring this one up on the screen. I didn't think I'd be sharing so many slides. <laughs> Um, oh no, that means me. I'm really a boring guest because if you're starting no. to share slides, we're we're going in the wrong direction. <laughs> no, I think it's because like we're talking about stuff that like super excites me, right? Like these are the things that I'm like, I just wish everybody knew. Like it's just plain wrong. So like what I bring up here is, and I think you're asking all the questions in the right order, because I think there. Uh, here's what I learned in journalism school. There's only six questions you can ask, right? Who, what, where, when, why, and how. But there's an infinite variation of those things. I use this paradigm. I call this seven W's. And I actually say that there is at least an, um, I don't know, there's not a right order, but there's a better order. So for those of you watching a live stream on YouTube, you can see this slide, but I'll walk you through it. The main mistake I think people make is they skip to number five. And number five is how. 
people will come to me and go, Jimmy, I want to launch a podcast. And I go, I don't know if that's a good idea or bad idea because you haven't told me who you want to talk to or what value you bring. So when you that's question five in my particular order, how I go through it. I like to ask the who question first. Get as, get as narrow as you want. I want to talk to physical therapy students who want to go into orthopedics, who want to be manual therapists. Great. This is the opposite of what Jimmy did for a living as a radio broadcaster, because now you can get, because of the internet and the cell phone that I'm holding, we can get really narrow. So I like number one is always a who. We start and end with people. Number two is I like to ask the what question. I like to know the bads and goods, as I call them hopes, fears, all the things Yoda was like warning Luke about, like fears and, 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 and insecurities and all the bads. What are the things that are holding you back, right? All your bads and then the goods, the opposites of those. What do you want to become? What do you want to grow into? What do you hope to accomplish? That is the audience's what. So that's why there are seven questions on my paradigm and only six questions in journalism schools because I ask this next question. I ask what again? So if you want to go AOMPT, you go AOMPT wants to talk to students, who are in PT school, who want to be manual therapists. There's your who. What is your what? Uh, here's their bads. There's so much information. It can be overwhelming. They don't have time. These are all common, right? These are all common complaints. I don't know who to trust. These two things have the same number of followers, and they're saying opposite things. My mind's going to explode. What are their goods? They want to be great. They want to be doing the right thing for their patients. They want to be treating at the top of their license. They want to be evidence-based. Great. Then I go to number three, which is what again, but if this is the AOMP example, what are the things you can provide? We have experts on this. This is, this is quite, this is our jam, as the kids would say. This is our wheelhouse. We have all the research distilled down. Oh, the student would go, I didn't know that. Oh, okay. So you list everything that you can offer this, this specific uh, who and where your what. And they're what cross in what? My favorite Venn diagram. That is your shared passion. That's your why. And as soon as I think, as soon as you get through these four steps, everything after this is, is simple, but not necessarily easy, right? But it gets a lot easier. Then, oh, well, now, yeah, everything you've just given me in step one, two, three, and four, a podcast would be a good idea. Would a YouTube channel? Yeah, it sounds like a YouTube channel could be. A blog? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All these things fit. And then I say, they say, well, which one should I do? And I get to pretend like I'm a PT professor. And I go, I don't know. It depends. depends. Which ones are you good at? Which ones do you like to do? Which ones are you going to be consistent at? After we answer how, let's just say we pick one. We're going to do a podcast. Great. Where are we going to do it? Uh, we're going to release it on YouTube. We're going we're gonna to do, this is the where question. And then when, how frequent, you know, how often, uh, you know, how long are the episodes? And then when you answer these questions in order, in my mind anyway, things get a lot clearer, but people often skip to that how. Because nowhere on there did I say social media. That yeah. is a distribution model. That to me is agnostic. It can be neither good nor bad, but we know I mean, Twitter can be a dumpster fire. But, <laughs> but you, you, you're not going to put the dumpster fire out. You're not. And you could, everybody could, right now we're talking about Elon Musk and everybody's going to quit Twitter and go to Mastodon or whatever they're going to do. Listen, yeah, just same stuff, different place, man. Like you can go somewhere else. It, there's no, there's no pan, there's no panacea here. So fight the good fight. I bring my, I don't even bother bringing the fire extinguisher out anymore to put the dumpster fire out. I just set up a camp down the street and I go, I don't know, I can't smell that dumpster fire from here. But that's what's in my head. That thing that I just shared there for the people watching my live stream. I think that's the way. I, I don't know. I hope it's the way because it's what I'm doing. No, I think. Well, I think what you're doing is definitely. Um different and it actually is a way that we need to be thinking beyond just and, and, and it's interesting too because we need to think beyond i mean the problem with misinformation is one there's bad information and then there are just so many ways that misinformation can be propagated and it seems like there is just something a new venue and a new way and a new yeah. manner and a new route that that can be um, handled. So I think, you know, the basic tenets though, of what you talked about there and the basic tenets of, I, I think a lot of it, as I said earlier, it's, you know, what we talk about in the class is really the inter, the, 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 the personal level. Um, and that's what we think that we can have the biggest impact on. And then hopefully we create right. like, so, so 10, 15 years ago, we wanted to create um, evidence-based PTs who were 
critical appraisers of literature. Okay. In 10 years from now, if we have PT students who are coming out who are critical appraisers of literature, they will not know how to critically appraise the other information that's out there. And we have to figure mm -hmm. out a point, mm -hmm. a way that we can get students and clinicians to do that because really that's where they're going to get their information from. And hopefully that information comes from research and evidence. And then it's ultimately right. our problem. So it's almost like the filter we have to, we have to, we have to analyze and critique the filter and not actually the source. Um, and I think that's where we're going to be, hopefully get the better information. Well, I feel good. I feel like we've just solved the problems. Now we just need other people to go out and do these things. <laughs> that's right no, i don't know if we've solved the problems but people, people talking about it i think talking about it definitely um at least yeah. hints at the idea that there's a problem and that uh we need to try to at least kind of figure some things out i like that all right you're ready to do uh three questions on the show okay i am let's do three questions all right. Uh, three questions brought to you by our friends at jackson therapy partners they provide awesome adventures in patient care for physical therapists who care about where they're going. Travel, physical therapy. Do what you want to do. Help people where you want to do it. Uh, JacksonTherapy.com is their website. All right. Who is someone the audience should know more about around today's topic? Who's someone that you think does it right? Who's someone when, when they crawl across your feed, you're like, yeah, this person's pretty reliable and I trust this person. Who's earned your trust? Yeah, you know, actually somebody that I've gotten to know a little bit over the last um, few months and over the last couple of years, but I've actually worked with a lot of few different things. Uh, I think Seth Peterson, the individual yeah. that we talked about, um, yeah. I think that he is doing it right. He, he looks at everything from, he's such a deep thinker. He looks at everything from a different angle and a different lens. I think if you learn, like, I think his information is good that he gets out there, but I think what's more interesting about Seth is if you can, if you can learn to try to think like him, I think that that's actually going to help solve some of those issues. So I'd say Seth yeah. Peterson. We got to get him on the show. I think I've, We've mm -hmm. talked about that. We'll do that. Second question on three question is, uh, what is something the audience should take a look at if they want to take a deeper dive? If someone says, you know what? I'm, I don't think I'm that great as, a, as an appraiser of research. Where would, where would you send them? Because after PT school, I didn't realize this, um, there's no professors around to answer all the questions I have. So where would you send one? Where's a, where would you send someone? Where's a good place to start in terms of appraisal research? Ooh, that's a really good question. I do actually, I think that there are some educational opportunities on some of the sites like either MedBridge, Trust Me Ed, that kind of stuff. I think some of those things are um, definitely helpful that can get you into some of the reps and sets on that uh, material. I think also too, and this probably leads to a little bit of misinformation, I think that YouTube can probably serve to have a lot of uh, decent information about how to uh, work with that. I think if you're in a health system, um, which a lot of our listener, your listeners are probably on. Uh, I would actually suggest getting in contact with the uh, medical librarian. Medical librarians are like the ultimate prize in this guy. I didn't realize it until I got to a health system and I got to there. Um, and it's amazing how efficient and how effective they can be. And, and I actually, I can kind of use them, but actually learning from them instead of learning from PTs who are doing research, they're, they're the experts really. We have talked about that too. We gotta we're gonna write that down. We need a list. Let's get a list started. I'm literally just yelling at myself in my house. Um, but I've heard that about medical librarians, like the unsung, like the just underutilized and like just ridiculous ROI. Uh, third question on three question: why should someone care about today's topic? Like if we were to um, start with the end in mind, right? Like if, if someone were to hear, we're going to make micro content out of this. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to edit out the, the next bit that you say, and I'm going to use that to get people to listen to this full episode. Why should people care about what we talked about today? Well, that's a lot of pressure. No I think pressure. a lot of people will care because one, they're listening to this episode. <laughs> so I true, think true. that we've I'm got a little bit of a, I right. think we got a little bit of a, a, a lead in that way. Well, talk uh, to I think Talk to people who, who, because listen, you got a bell curve, right? You people who are never going to hear my episode, people who listen to every episode, talk to the middle of the bell curve. Let's get more of those people in here. I think it's the people that are frustrated. I think it's the people that um, are, you know, on social media because they're just on social media. Sometimes they don't even know why they're on social media. They sit on a couch and they're sitting there digesting information and probably it's about their 
their friends and their, you know, new weddings coming up and things like that. But then it also boils back down to probably some level of PT information. And that's information that they're getting. And that probably either lends or a lot of times lends to frustration, arguments, things that are, you know, typically like, man, this is this, this, this material drives me nuts. And then it kind of pulls you away from some of that. I think that is, I think this information from this show, I think hopefully gives people an opportunity to, kind of think about things a little bit differently in terms of their interpretation of some of the material that is out there, how to set things up a little bit differently. But um, yeah, I think it's for the individuals who are sort of frustrated with how information is actually provided. That goes right into my bads and goods, right? You mentioned frustration. And I always say, if you're dealing with that paradigm that I put on the screen before, if you mention an emotion, you have got a just a way better chance of getting people's attention. And that's step one. If you don't have my attention, you're not getting anything, right? And everything is a transformation story. We are all the main characters in our own movies, whether you agree or not, right? Most of us think about it like that. And we're all, I mean, I don't know, hopefully all or a lot of us are trying to become something better. So if you can say, I know you want to be that Jedi and I can see the thing that's preventing you from getting there. And by the way, I know how to do this. I've done this before. I've taken people who are like you and through my program or AOM or whatever those organizations do, I can help you become the thing you want. That's when people will follow you for a good way, right? There's a follow for a good reason. I want to follow you. I want to be on this path with you, not just drone on and mindlessly follow. I want to walk the path with you. All right. Last thing we do on the show, conveniently sponsored by one of the organizations we talked about today. It's called The Parting Shot. And there it is, the logo placement. Uh, parting shot brought to you by the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Find them at orthopt.org. They've got this great resource, which we like to think does that, which is it takes you from wherever you are in your orthopedic career, and it's a roadmap to get you, well, confident and competent. Maybe you want to take that OCS exam. It's a great way to prepare for that. People who have put that resource together, current concepts, have said, listen, this is the way. We've done it before. Follow us in a good way. And you can get to that OCS exam. Again, that's at orthopt.org, along with some of their other great independent study courses. All right, parting shot, your last chance for a mic drop moment or a soapbox statement or anything else you want to wrap up with. What do you got, Derek? Oh, my gosh. I don't know if I have any soap. Well, I probably have a lot of soapboxes. Um, my last statement, I, I, I'd i say uh, it's been an honor to be on this show. Um, I think for a lot of PTs, getting to PT Pinecast is kind of one of the uh, the nice little pieces of a pinnacle of a career. So thanks for having me on the show. Our pleasure. I always love when there's people that come on the show and I'm like, yeah. And I started doing a little bit of prep and I'm like, I don't know, man, I'm going to do these. And my, my notes were literally like three things and that, and we've been talking for like an hour and I'm like, that's when you know it's going to be good. We were like, I don't know. I'm just going to put this down. I'm going to leave it here. We're just going to discuss. Uh, thanks for being open for this. Thanks for doing this type of thing at Duke and you know, the professors that, Maybe take a class that a lot of students might think isn't the sexy class, right? Evidence-based practice and research, right? And that put the effort into it to say, like, this is important. I'll put the effort into it to make it relatable to you and taking the extra steps because it is a fundamental thing that we should be thinking about as we are now in a doctoring profession. So uh, thanks for doing that. I appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. All right. They say the best conversations happen at happy hour. Thanks for coming ours. Like what you hear? Tell a friend or leave a review on iTunes or Google Play. The show today is brought to you by the Brooks Institute of Higher Learning, an innovator in providing advanced post-professional education. The Brooks IHL offers seven on-site PT residencies, including orthopedics, women's health, geriatrics, pediatrics, sports, and neurology, as well as a neurologic OT fellowship, a competitive OMPT fellowship, and a speech therapy clinical fellowship. Therapists that complete a residency or fellowship through the Brooks IHL will markedly advance their knowledge and skills in a specialty area of practice. Learn more about how a residency or fellowship can help you advance your professional development at brooksihl.org. Our home on the internet. 
ptpinecast.com. Created by Build PT. Build PT provides marketing services specifically for private practice PTs. From website development and hosting. Providing content marketing solutions for PT clinics across the country. See what Build PT can do for you today at buildpt.com. The PT Pinecast is a product of PT Pinecast LLC. It is hosted and produced by PT Pinecast CEO Jim McKay and CBO Sky Donovan from Marymount University. We talk PT, drink beer, and record it. This has been another pour from the PT Pinecast. The PT Pinecast is intended for educational purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based solely on one source. While care is taken to ensure accuracy, factual errors can be present. More on the show at ptpinecast.com. 